question. So uh, we've just gone over some of the basics of DBT, introduced uh, some of the power of just being able to write a SQL statement and that automatically turning into uh, a transformation. Um, talked a little bit about how um, DBT models, which is the term for a table or a view, um, can depend on other models and the sequencing can be happened automatically by DBT. Um, that also um, has the benefit of less allowing us to run things in parallel, et cetera. We'll talk more about that. So in this um, in this section, we will prop I think the um, we're probably gonna just go about 30 minutes on this section. And then we'll try to get the labs going again. Um, thanks to Owen for his help on that. Uh, if we do have good luck getting through those permission issues on the labs, um, I'd love for you all to be able to uh, play around in DBT. Um, if not, we'll follow up and we can, um, we'll follow up with Slack for those who are interested in doing that lab and figure out how do we get through that permission issue. But hopefully this afternoon, you all be, will be able to um, kick the tires on DBT yourself with the lab. Um, so for this section, um, we're going to talk about DAGs, um, the directed acyclical graphs. Um, a quick uh, show of thumbs here, uh, either virtual or live, if you've got your video on. If you know what a DAG is and if you used them before, or at least you're familiar with the term, a thumbs up real quick. I see a few people. Not cool. Yeah, so this is... Um, so if you've used Airflow before, um, you've probably heard of DAGs, um, but they're not a scary concept at all. They are getting increased popularity in the data community because they are powerful. Um, but, and I'll, I'll demystify that a little bit in the next, I think uh, in a couple of slides. So we'll talk about that. Um, we'll also talk about testing. Um, I mentioned one of the benefits of DBT is having confidence to be able to make any change or delegate any change to anybody on your team and know that nobody's gonna be able to break anything, which is a really cool thing in the data world where things are pretty fragile. Um, and one of the things that enables us to have such confidence is the testing we can build in. Um, and you know, you can always build tests regardless of the platform, but DBT makes it really easy. And by having tests being easy to create, you're gonna naturally have more of them. Having more of them means you're gonna have more coverage, et cetera. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, we're also going to talk about documentation. I demonstrated the DBT docs site. Uh, we'll show how to improve that with some um, human readable text descriptions and a little bit about model filtering and, and model selection. Yeah. And then we'll do a demo that, that covers some of these topics. So dumping, jumping in, um, just a quick recap. So you saw this slide before, but I'm going to recap just a few things. Um, on the left-hand side, we have the extract and load platform. Um, Singer, in the case of Meltano, is the, uh, is the tool used for extract and load. We land data in this raw zone. Um, and we're going to skip over the snapshot topic for now. The DBT does have this feature for snapshotting. Um, we've talked about transforms. We're going to talk about tests. Um, deployment and documentation are the other critical aspects here. Um, so we'll talk more about the deployment scenario in uh, the later session this afternoon and documentation we'll cover in just a second. So the final output of that is our transformed data, which can be consumed by BI tools, data science, et cetera. Um, built into the stack is version control. We'll talk more about um, Git um, and CICD this afternoon. Um, alerting and logging are kind of natural um, uh, value adds in this process. We won't go into depth on those two items today. Um, and anybody have uh, questions, um, just again, uh, feel free to jump in with any questions you might have. Um, again, you saw this slide before, but I wanna recap now that we've seen what DBT is doing. Um, so again, raw data lands here. DBT doesn't need to read from that, but it does map to it in the sources.yaml doc that we saw, um, where we say, okay, we've got a source called Pardot. It has these five tables. Even without enumerating the, um, the columns in those tables, um, DBT will automatically discover them, um, and the, all of the columns and tables will be available to DBT. And the same code, the same transformations can deploy to multiple environments as we saw. Cool. Um, all right, so now the fun stuff, so DAGs. Um, so I want everybody to just like come out of this. If you remember one thing, I want you to like remember that DAGs are cool and they're fun. Um, that's, that's well, hopefully you remember other things, but that's one thing to remember. Um, so 
any dag any any graph that does not circle back on itself and it goes in a single direction from you know left to right so to speak is a dag um, left to right or top to bottom um, you another common version of a dag or directed acyclical graph um, is an org chart right everyone reports to somebody and there's no loops where my manager ends up reporting to me and I'm also reporting to them, that doesn't happen. So the acyclical part of, um, of the graph just means there's no loops back. Um, so everything flows in one direction. Um, and uh, this is really helpful because if you know uh, which direction it's going, obviously, and you know what depends on what, then a lot of things can be happen automatically by the system. Um, there's no loops back, which means you can generate everything from scratch. There's no circular dependencies, meaning I have to have run it once in order to run it ever the second time. Um, and uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, Airflow is, is famous for the, I think they call it, some people call it the DAG bag. Um, and, uh, and Airflow works by you being able to declare tasks, each of them depend on the others, and um, then Airflow can run them all in sequence. So for dbt, um, for dbt, this might look like this. Um, I'm using a very simplified example, um, but uh, at the top of the DAG or the left-hand side, depending on how you want to think of it, you have all your raw data. And this is data that's probably not managed by dbt. And then you have some kind of a stage layer where you do some initial cleanup. I showed you that in the demo um, in the last session. You might have some intermediate work tables that you just don't want to expose to users, but you got some heavy lifting or some interesting transformations to do. And then finally, you have your end user tables. Um, so this is just a recommended design. DBT won't enforce that you like specifically have these layers, um, but I use this to kind of describe um, just a good practice. So then if let's say work table C needs some critical change and I want to update it, um, well, I can automatically up, I can fix some issue or improve the performance of work table C and then run everything downstream of C, which would be C, E, F, and not G, because there's no dependency there. Um, similarly, I can go back up the tree. If I want to see all of the things that affect fact table F, I see, oh, well, everything really affects fact table F. Um, if I want to see what affects fact table G, I can trace it up and see, okay, everything except these three, C, E, and F, affect G. So this is just natural analytics that you can do um, uh, based on the fact that you have a DAG underneath it. And a DAG is just, again, it's a graph of, of dependencies with everything going one way and no loops. So um, as we showed, uh, as, I, as I showed in the last one, each table or view is just a single select statement. Um, the cool thing about this is then dbt can build the entire database from scratch. Uh, and this allows you to basically do end-to-end -end testing without touching anything in production. Um, everybody can have their own entirely unique copy of the data warehouse um, or the database or whatever, you, data lake, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, without affecting others um, because all of it is declarative and able to rebuild itself. Um, the other cool thing is the parallel parallelization, uh, running things in parallel, um, because again, everything is declaratively top to bottom. You have all of the dependencies in line. DBT is smart enough to know it can run these two in parallel and it cannot run these two in parallel, uh, but it can run these two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you just tell it how many threads or how many processes you wanna run in parallel, it will just automatically do that in parallel, which is a huge time savings um, rather than running everything in sequence or trying to manually figure out a parallelization strategy. Um, cool, any questions so far? DAGs are making sense hopefully now, not very scary. Cool. Um, so this gets us then to what we can do with this, um, which is continuous deployment. We have a whole section this afternoon to talk about continuous deployment and Git, um, but I think it's worthwhile bringing up now. Um, that dbt run command we saw is just going to be run all the time. <laughs> it's going to be run on your local machine while you're testing things out, just to see, like, hey, yeah, still green, it worked, and then you can test the date on your side. In beta and production, it'll be happening on a recurring schedule with again different configurations, so it deploys to production or beta instead. But the same command is being run in all of these places, um, and um, and during development, we'll talk about what CI/CD is and all that, how that works. But every time you commit and save your work 
you're going to push it back to the cloud to your Git repository. And if you have CI CD set up, it'll automatically test your code by running dbt run and the following tests. So, um, you know, easily 10 to 20 times per day, you're getting a nice confirmation um, and or an error message of where something went wrong. Contrast this with the way we used to work where I'm gonna spend a week on a project, by the next week, I'm gonna to try to merge it back, find some errors and have to trace through all of the last week's work to figure out where that error was. Um, if I even find the error. Um, in this case, I'm finding the error about 10 minutes after I made it, maybe an hour or two or three hours after I made the error. And so I immediately, I know what I changed in the last two hours, I fix it right away. Um, and it's not that we couldn't test projects before, but this is just like ridiculously easy to do the tests and fully automated too when we have the CI CD pipeline set up. So there's really, um, there's no barrier to getting good test data. And um, yeah, so we'll talk more about this, but I just want to tease this as it relates to that dbt run and all of these things having their dependencies built in, um, because although behind the scenes, it can feel really complex, all you have to do is modify the select statements, run dbt run again. <laughs> it's like super, it's super easy uh, when it comes down to it. All right, um, so we've talked about this, um, but I want to I highlight it again. Um, there is no insert, delete, or merge um, functionality here. And that's on purpose because we need these to be a directed acyclical graph and acyclical being the important part here. If I'm doing insert, deletes, or merge, then I'm relying upon the previous state of when I ran this. And I don't wanna do that because that prevents me to be able to run it again. Um, so that's one of the biggest barriers people run into if they've worked on ETL projects in the past is how do I update those records? No, you don't, you don't. Just declare how you want the table to look and let dbt do the rest. Um, it might seem counterintuitive. It might seem slower to, um, to write all of the records each time. In reality, the database platforms of today are tuned for that. They're tuned for high throughput, front to back reading of the entire data set and writing of the entire data set. They are not tuned for random access and seeking to, okay, let's find the 343rd record and update it. Uh, that's not a very efficient process in today's, um, in today's data platforms. And I'm not gonna do a deep dive into all the, you know, the, the backend engineering stuff of why that happens. But a big reason is that most data sets now are columnar data sets. Um, and how you modify a columnar data set and read the columnar data set is just very different than traditional rows and columns. Anyway, um, so just to say select is the way to go. You don't need insert, delete, and merge anymore. Um, and the whole point here is to have a repeatable and scalable system that you can have confidence as you iterate. Um, cool. So now we get into testing. Um, I'm going to do a demo on this in a sec, but I just want to introduce a few comments, uh, concepts. Um, in dbt, um, there are a few different ways to define tests, but I'm describing, I'm showing you the easiest one here. Um, you know, we should, we, I think I showed you the sources definition where you listed tables. Um, you can also have models, which just adds metadata to the models you have in your project already. Again, this name should be the same name as the file without the .sql. Um, description is totally optional and not related to the tests. Um, but I'm calling that out here also because this is how you add some user-friendly documentation so that when your end users end up on this um, uh, in your doc site, they know what this table is supposed to do. Um, so I do think it's a good idea to have descriptions for all your user-facing tables. And then in your internal tables, um, this description can be helpful amongst the team to describe <laughs> why does this intermediate take, like what's the work, you know, especially if you have like these really long um, select statements to explain what is this table trying to accomplish um, is a good a good use of the description. Um, and then finally, getting to the test function. This is it. You just, uh, per column, you declare a column, um, ignoring the description for right now, just specify tests and what kind of test. So there are a set of built-in tests you can just list here. Um, and if you uh, just put it in this list, uh, it'll automatically add that test to the suite. Uh, and you'll get that anytime you run um, the sister command to dbt run, which is dbt test. So you run dbt run, dbt test after that, and you get this confirmation, did it work or not? I'll show you that in the demo. Um, 
Let me pause here for questions. Any questions on tests and documentation? So what, wait, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So what the description part, that would be like what you showed on the last demo, the DBT docs, and it would be there? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. And yeah, in this case, I've used a, um, a uh, model level description, which describes this table and a column level description, which describes this column. I could have optionally even provided a test level description. What would the test level, um, uh, oh, as in the in, test that you're running in, in YAML? Case, yeah, in this case, the test is ridiculously simple. So like we wouldn't really have a description for, for this, but in other cases, um, like you can actually create a test that's based on a SQL query. Um, and in that case, or some custom test, you might provide an explanation for what we're testing. I'll show, I'll show that in the demo. Yeah, any other questions? I had a quick question. So you said unique is built in as a test. Yeah. Um, is, there, is there a place you can find that code? And then is that the same place you would code your own? Um, not exactly, but thanks. Uh, let me show you um, the tests. So um, for tests, let me see if I can find the list. I'm on the DBT docs site, which by the way is, is really great. Um, so let me see if I can find real quick the tests or failures. They've actually recently changed this. So I'm uh, trying to find it again. Um, let me see if I can find unique uh, test name unique. Maybe it's here. Yes. Okay. Here's, here are some built-in values. Let me drop this into the Zoom chat. Um, but here you will find a list um, of some built-in tests. So not null uh, is uh, <laughs> not null is often combined with unique to, to define a primary key. So you'll often often see this pattern of just both the unique and not null set on a column. Um, but you often have other keys in your table that are not the primary key, but also supposed to be unique. So it might be an internal ID and then a name that you kind of assume is unique, even if it's not like strictly part of the data model. Um, so you can specify that here. Um, accepted values is kind of like an enumeration. So uh, I only want these values to be allowed in my data set. And then if a fifth value shows up, throw an alarm because I'm not ready for that. <laughs> so it can be really helpful to define those. If you think a call, always test your assumptions. If, if you were told that this column always contains the text yes or no, don't be surprised that you might get a Y or an N. And, um, and these tests allow you to confirm that assumption within the code. And then also once they're placed there, they'll prevent against future drift uh, where originally there was some spec and then in the future, somebody like fat fingers some value that wasn't supposed to be there or some DBA does a manual update and produces some different result. What, what this allows you to do is catch those errors and then you would fix them in your model to conform to whatever. So an example of yes or no and Y and N, once you find out that a new value is showing up, you could just do a replacement in your model and then it still conforms to this rule. Um, and that way your end users don't have to change their behavior um, you can just adapt to that. So um, yeah, so here's some examples. There's also referential integrity. Um, so if you want to test that a customer ID actually exists in the customer's table, you can do that as well. The syntax is a little bit more complex, but still pretty straightforward. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, there's just more and more examples of different tests you can do. Um, the other thing that I'll quickly show is the custom generic tests. You can actually write your own validation SQL. Um, so we're not gonna do this, but if you wanted to, like for this for this example, I guess is, a, <laughs> is even is the test. Uh, so if you like, we're wanting to create, like, oh, this column should only contain e even numbers or, some other weird complex validation. Um, what you're just doing is writing um, a test that should return zero results. And you just write a SQL query that returns zero results. If it returns zero results, the test passed. If it returns some other value, then the te test has failed. Make sense? Thanks for that question. 
um, while I'm here on the DBT docs. Um, any other questions on the types of tests that are built in? Um, I think I have this up already and I have rerun it based on, let me actually just switch real quick to a short, actually, no, we'll come back to the demo. Um, for right now, let's let's keep moving because I think we're almost through this deck. Um, so I've we, we've seen now um, that you can define tests in YAML um, declaratively with a very simple syntax. There are a few different built-in tests already available, and um, and you can also provide custom tests, um, and you can provide descriptions at the column level or model level. All right. Um, so uh, thumbs up or, or hands. Uh, some show if you know what a type two dimension is or a slowly changing dimension. Anybody work with slowly changing dimensions? Is, yeah. Is no? that like a window function? Or? Yeah. So I'm going to show how to handle it with window functions. Um, but um, a type two dimension or a slowly changing dimension um, is just the concept of um, like, I want to keep track of my records as they change. So let's say I have a customer and they move from the Northeast region to the Northwest region. I might want to keep those as two separate rows with a start and end date um, to keep track of um, that change before and after. So if I want to see how many customers that I have in July, um, that record will properly show up in July when it was uh, in the Midwest and in August, it was in a different region. So you actually just, it's like a, like a dimension or a lookup table, like the list table I showed we did with customers, but with specific um, 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 start and end dates. So uh, if, if you are not used to uh, working with slowly changing dimensions, that's actually great because you have nothing to unlearn. This whole section is for people who like have learned a certain way of dealing with slowly changing dimensions. It specifically manages with like a merge upsert and updating records and deleting records manually. Sorry, my pup is um, making a little bit of a ruckus. I might have to um, put her in her crate in a sec. Um, so, so apologies for the background noise if you're hearing a, a puppy scramble around. Um, so uh, as, as was mentioned, um, the way to implement slowly changing dimensions in a declarative form with DBT is to use window functions. So um, if you've used window functions before, this is doing a row number over a specific partition. Essentially, we want a formula that prints out a recency rank that we can then filter for one. So if I have multiple records for my customer, it's changed 15 times, um, I can optionally filter this for the most recent record. All right, pup. Um, uh, I'm going to get through these two slides. I'm going to um, put her in her crate. Um, so uh, similarly, you can just reverse it to create a version number for each row. So if a certain data set has gone through a few iterations, you might want to say, OK, what's my version one of this customer? And then they change what's the version two of them as, as some attribute of that dimension has changed over time. Um, is deleted. This You don't have to memorize this at all. I'm just showing that there are tricks. Um, you can infer what's deleted if they're not long, if they're no longer in the latest version of the raw data, um, assuming you're getting full tracks. Um, yeah, so that's enough of the like kind of hacky SQL workarounds. Again, if you've not tackled this before and you've not like um, had to deal with slowly changing dimensions before, then you don't have anything to unlearn, which is which is great. Um, cool. So. Uh, why are we doing DevOps and why are we like using tools that support DevOps and data ops specifically? Um, some benefits here are we can just move faster when all we have to do is like add or modify a SQL file and then commit and push it. And that's literally all we have to do. Uh, we can develop much faster than we could using traditional tools. Um, so think about that list of characters that I was working on. Um, I made five changes in 10 minutes and, uh, and then pushed the result. So like that was super fast. Um, also, it allows um, for us to have a repeatable measurable process. So if I run that on my machine and you run it on your machine, it should have the same result. Or if it runs in the cloud, regardless, it'll always have the same result, which gives us a lot of confidence that we're looking at the same thing and we, um, you know, we can have confidence that we're not breaking anything and that we're moving forward. 
that results in faster innovation, uh, which I think I'm going to talk in the next section about uh, like developers having fun. But for me, that's that makes it more fun for me. If I can innovate quicker, if I can build things faster, I just have more fun than if I'm stuck in you know maintenance and operations mode. Um, yeah. So there's some other benefits here. We'll talk more about this later. Um, but but this approach is going to make teams more effective. Um, after you've adopted it. And that's why DBT is becoming more and more popular in the data space uh, for transformations. Um, yeah. Cool. So uh, let's dive into that demo now. Um, we are just about 30 minutes. So it's perfect, perfect in timing. Um, all right. So I've created um, right here a schema.yaml file. Let me show my work. Um, so this is the same project we were working on before. We have a list of characters in the Mart folder. And in the stage folder, we have all of our staging queries. Um, list of characters is using the aliases we already put in, um, in the stage layer. So we don't have to change any of that. And, um, and it's referring to that table. So, so far, so good. Um, now, anywhere in a YAML file in any of these folders, um, I can start writing metadata. The convention is to call it schema.yaml, but it can really be called anything at all. Um, so uh, this version two just is for compatibility reasons, and then you list models. Um, I already showed this in the slide, so um, should should make sense. Um, but I'm going to show now what happens when I run dbt with this. So I'm going to open a new terminal. I'm going to run melt, so dbt run. I actually should show that you can also do Meltano invoke dbt run. Um, this will carry forward any environment variables you have declared in Meltano. Um, so this is another way to run it. Um, dirty secret, I've actually aliased dbt to actually run through Meltano anyway through the repo. Um, but just to show you, you can run it either way. Um, all right, so let me quickly show this. All right, so we have the same um, the same process that we saw before um, finished, and then I'm going to run a dbt test, and hopefully I should see my tests passing. Uh, while this is running, I'm going to do as promised and put my pup um, into her crate. I'm going to um, make her pay with her, for her annoyance by making her be a little bit cute for a second. All right. This is her. This is Pip. Say hi, Pip. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Remember when we used to go into offices and didn't have dogs running around and children running around? No. Nope. Used to be a thing, right? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember. It was too long ago. Um, so, okay, here we are. And it looks like while I was putting the pup away, um, my test passed. Um, notice it automatically got a name, um, the name of the test that was being run. Um, the name of the model that was being tested, the name of the column that was being tested. So this is now a unique name auto-generated by DT I can use to refer to this test. So let's see what do the docs look like. Um, so this is a two-part command, dbt docs generate, and I'm just gonna immediately run dbt docs serve. Uh, so you can kind of chain those two together um, if you want to just immediately uh, resurface the docs or, or uh, show the docs immediately after they're generated. Oh, I'm already posting that. So let's see if it's linked. So uh, we have in our database. So I think I showed you this project view. This is broken into sources and the projects themselves. Um, there's also a database view. Um, so you can browse either way you want. I'm gonna stick with project view, go to Mart and look at list characters. So um, cool, I see my description is here now, um, which provides a description of this table. 
Um, I could put anything I want here and it could be several paragraphs describing how to use this. You could have a link to like jump to support channel or Slack channel or some other documents that you have. Um, really, it's just kind of up to your creativity and resources about what you want to uh, put here. Um, then under columns, notice that one of my columns now has a description here, the unique integer key for the, um, and if I click on it, I'll see the full details. Um, also note that, that under the test column, there's a U now, and the U means unique. Um, so that if I'm, again, if I'm a developer, that's handy, but I could have just looked at the code. This is more for stakeholders and users to be able to quickly scan through here and see what's in this table, what can I expect of this data? Um, if I'm writing a BI report, I do want to know what's the unique key so I can join on it. Um, and what other columns, how do I properly interpret this data? So um, cool. So we have the uniqueness test defined here, um, the description of the column, and of course it's type and uh, it was already there. Um, now we have this referenced by that points to this test description. Um, so if I click on here, I see that this is that point I was mentioning where we could optionally <laughs> add a description to describe what this unique test is doing. I don't, I think that would be overkill. I don't think we really need that, but if you wanted to, you could. Um, and then also really interesting is this is all behind the scenes, but it's interesting to see what um, DBT is doing with this. So this is some Jinja that I've never seen and don't really understand and don't really need to, um, but it compiles into this SQL query that I could run on my own database and use to find the culprit, <laughs> use to find where is the, the validation error happening. Um, it's selecting from here, counting the records from the table, where the character D is not null and grouping by this, having count as one. So this is a query that lets me validate or replicate the results of the test. If I had run a custom query, then of course my custom query would be here because I used one of the built-in tests. This is just for transparency and re repeatability that it's, it's nice to have this test browsable. Um, so just for fun, let's go back here. And in addition to the unique test, Let's set the, uh, is it not null or non-null? Uh, I think that if I get it wrong, I'll get an error message, but let's also jump over to the docs we had open. Yep. I think it was here, unique, not null. Yeah, so that's the name of the test. That's what I put in, um, I can't, Re, um, let's see if I can refresh this and it will show. Oops, let's go back to one layer back. Okay, list characters. And it doesn't look like this is updated yet. That might be because I have multiple instances of the server open. Sorry about that. Oh, it is updated. There it is. Okay, so now I see there are two tests being defined on this column, unique and not null. Um, and if I expand it, I can see that those specifically say unique and not null. So uh, when, uh, when we were building this at Slalom, we eventually came to a consensus within the development team that every table should at least have a unique and not null constraint. So the user knows how to use it, but also if somebody misses a join somewhere that just immediately gets exposed. So you and your teams will develop kind of as a team, what kind of best practices do you want to enforce or, or promote. Um, and um, it's super easy once you just make a commitment to having one test per file, even on your sources, so that you, um, at least on your source data, you have some of your basic assumptions tested. So for instance, is this ID expected to be uh, unique? Or uh, do I think that there might be multiple versions of this as it changes? So whatever that assumption is, we should assert it here in the tests. Um, so that we can stop thinking about it, and it's not no longer an undi it's no longer an untested assumption is now a tested assumption. Make sense? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Yeah. Whenever you're looking at um, not mm -hmm. sources the project, mm -hmm. is the test only running on the character ID um, column, or is it on the whole table? And if it's just on that column, is there any way to roll up that test like not null for the whole table? That's a great question. Um, so I don't know of a way off the top of my head 
to test. So the, the first answer, the simple answer is that this is just testing the column. Um, if Do you mean you want to test each column um, and make sure none of the columns are null? Yeah, that would, that would be like ideal. Yeah. So I think right now, I don't know of any tricks, um, but uh, I think that would just mean listing each of the columns and adding at least a not null descriptor. So the next one I would add would be, I think we called it character name. Um, and then let me just quickly do this. Uh, let's assume that character name is also unique, um, even though it doesn't have to be, I think it'd be confusing to have two characters with two with the same name. And if that were true, I'd wanna know about it. So I'm gonna just assume that this is, that's true. And let's do at least one or two more other columns, um, status, species, and type. So let's go character name. So uh, pasted it a couple times. So let's make this one status and species. And uh, so I'm not going to spend the time to write descriptions, and I'm not going to assume these are unique, but I am going to assume they're not null. Great. Um, so I think I've just added test for the rest of these columns. Yeah. OK, so now I'm going to run it again. Uh, so I'll run dbt test. I don't need to rerun it because I haven't changed the data. I, sorry, I don't need to rebuild the tables because I've only changed the tests. And what failed? Look at that. So this is why these tests are really cool is you find out um, if you're right or not about your assumptions. And it looks like my assumption about the character names being unique was wrong. Um, there are apparently 35 <laughs> violations of that rule. So um, I'm gonna have to, you know, later on I might go investigate that. And that's where this SQL can be super handy. Um, notice if I click on it, it'll open up the file and show me that validation test. So I could use this to reproduce and research the issues. Um, all right, so I'm gonna close this though. For right now, I'm just gonna remove that offending test. So I'm not gonna assume the name of the character is unique. Let's try running it again. So is this uh, answering your question, Kiyoma? Yeah, I wonder why can't you in underneath modules just do the test there? Like why does it have to be on the columns? Um, uh, there is probably a way to do uh, what you're saying also to do like a top level. Um, I just don't know what it is. Um, so one of the cool things about Jinja um, is that you can write very, very complex tests um, that depend on different parts of the metadata. What I imagine you would probably do is to write a custom SQL test, um, which, um, which uses a function that I think is called get columns. Um, what I can do is I can go to this Jinja reference and browse through Jinja functions. And there might be something here that shows, yeah. So model, I think, would give us, or schema. One of these two things would probably let us interrogate the column list. Yeah, so model, it's saying model and schema are the same thing. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know off the top of my head, but in theory, you could write something that iterates through all of the columns in the table. Um, and then writes a test based on all the columns available. Um, and I'm unfortunately not able to give you like a direct how-to, except I do think it's possible. Uh, one of the things to watch out with, watch out for in that case though, is if one of your columns stops being unique, then you have to like completely change the whole table level validation. Um, so um, in this case, if character name stops being if there's a null value in character, or I think more likely status, um, I think I saw there were some blank values in there. Um, I could easily just remove or change this test per column. If it's already defined at the table level, you just have a little less flexibility, but I, I'm pretty sure there's a way to do it. It's just not a use case I've run into. Okay, cool. And then my last question, sorry. Yeah, my no last question is, um, 
this syntax here is this ginger or i thought we were yeah so right now we're just in markdown um okay. so when i mentioned ginger um what i was referring to is the ability to like write just arbitrary sql tests um but in arbitrary let me actually this this is not it uh it's not helpful let me just pause my screen share um so in an uh, if I want to write really complex uh, tests, remember everything is SQL and SQL doesn't have the ability to like check every column. That's just not a feature in SQL. So you would have to iterate through the columns, meaning like uh, you'd have to just say for each column, run this test. And that's not natively supported in SQL, but Jinja allows you to, again, inject like superpowers into your SQL so that you could actually iterate through the columns. And if the column looks like this, do this. If the column looks like that, do that. And because DBT does have the metadata on what the column descriptions are and what the that data is, um, it can feed you information that you can loop through and create really crazy advanced stuff. Um, I like to, like, when I can, I like to veer away from that because it's hard for other people to read and test. Um, but, uh, I, but it certainly is cap a capability. And some people are like, some people have created like ridiculously complex advanced tests um, and not only tests, but also using it for other kind of database manipulation. Um, a, a common example is like a pivot. Pivot is like kind of hard to do in traditional SQL. And so there's some, there's some tools for that. Yeah. Is that helpful at all? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so Markdown is going to be super easy, and it's like because it's so easy, it's the first place you want to go. But as you have more advanced requirements, either from your team or just your own creative ideas, um, the place to go do that is to um, to like figure, like learn more about Jinja macros and tests, and you can ex extend the capabilities that way. Yeah, cool. Um, well, we have demonstrated. Um, I think let me just do one more thing, which is get the docs back up. So I'm resuming dbt docs generate. And because I'm already sharing, I think I'm just going to refresh that page. So I want to see that the new tests that I've created are properly showing up. So I go back here, my dbt docs, and I'll refresh this page. And, you know, within Let's see, knock on wood. <laughs> Let's see. Yep, it's written. Um, yeah, still refreshing. All right. And oh, I'm in the wrong table. Let's go to the correct table. Yeah, so I can see now we have more tests listed. Um, we have one more description added and all of these, um, we can click to expand the details here. Um, so yeah, um, cool. Um, any, any questions, thoughts? Does it make sense um, so far how, how you'd basically go about developing a project? Cool, I see some head nods. Um, great. Well, um, with that, we're going to um, see if we can't get you guys up and running. Uh, let me just check my the deck and make sure I've finished all. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, I'm logged out. I think that I think we're at the end of the deck anyway. So yeah, we're at the end. Um, so wrapping up this section. Um, uh, we have a couple of tips in the Meltano Slack uh, um, that may or may not um, help people get through this, um, this testing. I'm going to put it up on screen and kind of talk through that with you real quick in case you would like to try getting this running on your, uh, on your laptops. Let's see, where are we? Okay, so um, here we are. Um, close up some of this stuff. So um, here we are. So I'll walk through this process. 
Um, but first, just to summarize, um, the issue that we ran into looks like it was caused by permissions and specifically where um, GitHub tries to download that package um, when you just click on the badge. Um, so instead of clicking on the badge, um, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna clone the repo from, um, from VS Code. So the way that you can do that is start with file, new window. I'll go through these instructions and if people are able to follow along, um, please do so. Um, and I do, I'm hopeful that this will work. Uh, it just has been a little tricky to replicate some of the permission issues for this time around. So I'm gonna close this, I'll do file, close. You shouldn't have to um, close anything, but you can if you want. Um, if you're not yet at a new blank window, you can say file new window uh, to get to a new window or just close the project like I just did. Uh, from here, um, we're going to go to the view menu command palette, or you can just learn the shortcut for command palette or just click on run a command, but view, oops, sorry, did I get that right? View, does it not show up on a new project? Oh gosh. All right, uh, it looks like it's, in, oh wait, I'm in the wrong screen, I'm on Slack. <laughs> That's my problem. Uh, okay, so from, from VS Code, view command palette pops up this little type anything here. And you want the git clone option because um, we're gonna clone this um, directly. Uh, the other way to get to this is this shortcut in shift command P. Um, I think on Windows, it might be shift control P um, to pop this up. And then just type the command you want. And in our case, we want git clone. So we're gonna get we're gonna hit git clone. We're gonna paste in the uh, the URL for the repo, and then go ahead and clone that. It should prompt you for a location, um, and um, it's not. It's a little bit different for me because I'm I didn't actually go through the process of creating a new window, so it's trying to create it in the wrong place. But after, um, when it prompts you for a location, as I put right here, um, do, um, uh, you do want to um, select something in your documents folder um, just to make sure the permissions are correct. What we found was that the way it was downloading it, it, it does automatically, at least on the Mac, um, have default permissions for the user, your users folder, um, which should include your documents folder but not for other folders, just randomly in your, um, in your machine. And then um, after you've cloned it, um, and you can clone it other ways too, if you're familiar with Git and you have other tools that can clone repos, there's also a command line way to do it, um, but I'm just giving you one way. Um, and then after it opens, it will probably prompt you to open in a container, in which case just say yes to that, just click that option. Um, if you don't see the prompt, there's an instruction here to get to that um, command directly. Um, and then the last thing to look out for is watch out for anything on your screen asking you for permission. <laughs> um, those kind of get hidden in the background sometimes. So if you have multiple windows open, maybe hide them um, because that can um, that can easily get hidden. So um, yeah, uh, if anybody has has luck. Uh, with this process, um, please give me an update as you're going through. Um, Bailey, I see you laughing. Any luck there? Sorry to pick on you. No worries. Uh, yeah, no worries. Um, anybody else um, have luck so far in adding, um, at least cloning the repo? Yeah, I think I cloned the repo. Uh, once we have that done, should we just be able to, in a terminal, enter a dbt run and have something happen? No, you'll you'll yeah. still need to reopen in a container. Um, oh yeah, well, I think I am in the container. Okay, yeah. So if you're in a container, then at the bottom left you should see something like this dev container. Yeah. Great. Um, it, and it didn't work when I tried to do the dbt run. <laughs> which is okay. what I'm asking. Um, it might take a second for everything to install um, or a, few, a minute or two. Um, 
if you have any terminal windows open and just kind of confirm that they are not still running. Um, because the first thing it's going to do when it launches that container is it's going to install um, all the plugins. Yeah, well, I get the an error code that the executable dbt could not be found. Mm -hmm. And then it makes a suggestion for installing with a Miltano command, mm -hmm. but that seems to be failing as well. Yeah, um, I think that that is just, um, hopefully you have another terminal where things are still installing. Um, do you mind, Katie, sharing your screen and we can take a look real quick? Sure. Uh, maybe once your screen share is. Oh, I got to give you access. Yeah. One yeah. Second. All right. There you go. Yeah, I think uh, the DBT could not be found is actually pretty. I'm happy with that because I think that I'm hoping that it's installing in the background and we'll finish. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Okay. So I click on in the tabs of your terminal. You have a couple right above. There's configuring and there's dev container um, to the right at the bottom right in your terminal area. Yeah. Click on the first one and then click on the second. Yeah. Uh, you were just there. Yeah. Those are tabs in your terminal. So you can click on uh, click on one of them and let's see what's running. Um, scroll down to the bottom of that. Uh, that's fine. Scroll down. Uh, okay. What's the next? What's the one just above that? Failed to install plugins. Uh, can you scroll up and see what failed to install? Uh, pyro. Um, NumPy. Uh, can you just try? Yeah, rebuilding, okay, from Matt suggested maybe rebuilding the container might help. Um, try also, just try running in your terminal Meltano install, or actually um, the command that it tells you to run might actually be good. In the other bash- I've, I've tried it. Oh, okay. And then it gives you, let's see that. Uh, I don't remember where it- uh, It's the third tab, I think, in that list. Yeah, so. So uh, try that Meltano install transformer dbt. And it like takes a couple minutes and then it. It throws that error. Yeah. Or I think I might like try a few times because it, it like populates mm -hmm. a couple times. Yeah, it was running. It was possibly running in the background still. Um, okay. Yeah, if anybody does have success, let us know. And again, uh, I do apologize. This is, um, it was smoother when we just had a single container and I didn't realize that going to a Docker Compose with multiple containers was gonna also create um, permissions issues. So um, let's see if this doesn't work. Or, or there might be some there's some might be some other version conflict that's happening here, but it's weird is that it didn't happen elsewhere. Um, 